Hi, everyone. Welcome to Poet to Poet. I'm Rana Markham, and today I have the pleasure of talking to poet Rebecca Aronson, author of Anchor. Before I introduce you to Rebecca, I'd like to invite you to become a subscriber of Poet to Poet if you aren't already. Um, just go to Substack, uh, poettopoet.substack.com and subscribe for free. In it, you'll find interviews like this one, plus helpful ideas on writing and publishing books of poetry. So today I'm thrilled to introduce you to Rebecca Aronson. She's the author of Anchor, most recently published in 2022 by Orison Books. Ghost Child of the Atalanta Bloom, winner of the 2016 Orison Books Poetry Prize and winner of the 2019 Margaret Randall Book Award from the Albuquerque Museum Foundation. And Creature Creature, winner of the Maine Traveled Roads Poetry Prize in 20, or 2007. She's been a recipient of a Prairie Schooner Strauss Award, the Lofts Speakeasy Poetry Prize, and a Tennessee Williams Scholarship to Sewanee. She's co-founder and host of Bad Mouth, love that name, by the way, a series of words and music, um, and she teaches writing at CNM in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So welcome to Poet to Poet. Thank you, happy to be here. So Rebecca, Anchor is a gorgeous book, beautiful, and what I would consider a highly thematic book. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, can you describe, maybe we'll start with you describing the themes for us. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I would say the themes of Anchor are, are loss, grappling with loss and grief and mortality, um, and also memory and parenting, mm. <laughs> and actually being parented as well. There's sort of both ends of the parenting spectrum in there. Mm -hmm. Great. And so as you were writing this material, you know, we were talking a little bit beforehand, um, you said that you you sort of came into these themes um, in, in a potentially different way than you had before. So I'm curious, what at what point did you think, oh, I've got the start of a book here? And how did the themes arise in your writing process? Okay, so yeah, I, it was a very different process for me because I've always been kind of a poet who just writes, you know, a poem at a time and then my first two books were very much like a collection of here's some poems I wrote oh, that, you know, not that there weren't thematic connections happening, because I think we all tend to be obsessed over the same sorts of things over periods of time. But, um, but they, they weren't quite coherent in the way that Anchor is. Um, Anchor arose when my, my parents both were ailing, my father um, had Parkinson's, he was not yet diagnosed, and he, um, he was falling a lot. And I was flying from Albuquerque to Minnesota to be with my parents. Um, and my mother had dementia at the same time, so that both these health issues happening. And I was spending a lot of time um, in hospital rooms. And the first um, I started thinking because my father was falling a lot, I started thinking about this force of gravity and realized I didn't really like we take it for granted, but I didn't really know what it was. Um, and so I started doing some kind of light reading um, Carl, Ro Carl Rovelli's seven brief lessons on physics um, to help me understand it, um, which was helpful. And at the same time, in maybe my more poety way, I was kind of also picturing gravity as a as a kind of character, a, a, like a sort of capricious god or maybe a, a mischievous bully. Um, and so I was sitting in a hospital room while my dad slept on one of the visits towards the end of his life. And I started writing a letter to gravity and that was pretty unplanned. I just, I wrote in my, scribbled in my notebook, Dear Gravity, and then just went from there. And that was the first of the Dear Gravity poems. And then I kept doing that. Um, and I, I wrote probably, I don't know, I wrote probably 15 of them or so, and uh, 10 of them ended up in one form or another in the book. And they form, I, I would say, kind of the spine of the book. And th that 
um, that's kind of what helped me realize that once I realized that I had a bunch of these and that the other things I was writing all kind of spun from those letters, um, I began to realize that I might have a manuscript. Wonderful. Um, that's so fascinating, the way that you took that, that phenomena um, that, you know, applied to, like you said, this theme of loss, grief, feeling, you know, our mortality, um, embodying that force in a character and then writing to that character. So, so it's just interesting to see how that all sort of develops in the mind of, um, of a poet like yourself. So that's really a wonderful um, picture of how it might happen. Um, so would you mind reading for us maybe one of the Dear Gravity poems? Sure, I'd be happy to. All right, um, the first one I'm going to read. So they're all called Dear Gravity. Um, Dear Gravity, I know your voice. It is volcano deep, a rumble like a rhythm that is felt but not heard. Still, it drops me. Wherever I am, I feel you speaking through the gum stuck walk or the flame orange hedge or in my tear ducts, which let down their water unbidden. What could be less convenient? I'm always crying in the naked sunshine. I blame you for reminding me every hour to look down to where loss is kept, the scattered leaves and underneath a bird's wing partitioned into smooth gray fingers. My own hands swell and shrink with the weather. How vexing to be made an instrument that measures only what can't be mastered. I miss skipping, though I could still do it. I miss that I skip. I miss that I could skip and feel the kind of alive that made me dizzy, so I would have to fling myself on the grass with my head thrown back. The hum I felt there, a song I can almost recall the lyrics to. It's lovely. Thank you. I, I love the, the sounds and the imagery and how they go um, sort of back and forth and, and in this epistolary letter form, um, it, it holds a lot. There's a lot of potential there. So um, it's just such a beautiful example of that. So I am curious how many years, so it sounds like you were in sort of this unique confluence of things happening. Um, how many years did it take to develop the poems that became this manuscript? I think, um, I think of it as like, 2017 to 2020, but actually I, it was probably a bit longer than that because I know some, a few of the poems in the book are older than that or maybe from 2015 or so. Um, but so about five years total, but the Dear Gravity poems really started, I think, in 2017. So I had poems that ended up in the manuscript, but kind of the center of it didn't cohere until around 2017. Um, so, which for me is super fast. I'm I'm a slow, slow compiler, a slow writer, and you know, both the first and second book came together much more slowly. So it was, and it was almost a sort of accidental. That is, I I had the Dear Gravity poems. I had other poems that I thought might kind of fit, and I stuck them all in a Word document and just printed them out to see what was there, and shocked myself because I hadn't didn't feel like I had been writing a lot with all, especially with, you know, working full time, parenting, and then traveling during those years so frequently to Minnesota. I felt like I was never never had time to read or write or do anything, breathe. Um, so it kind of shocked me to discover that I actually had all these, all these poem drafts and that they all, they all, there were threads that were clear to me that connected them. It was an unexpected delight in, in a pretty hard time to discover like, oh, there's, there's maybe a book here. I think so many poets that I, um, am, you know, peers with, friends with, know are kind of in the same boat, right? Where life is happening all around us, where, you know, time time is so precious. Um, it feels like we're not doing the writing that we should be doing. Maybe there's that should in there, um, at least for me, that should kind of comes into it. Um, what, 
you know, when you look back, how were you getting um, those poems done? You know, what, how, how was the process? How did the process fit into all of, all of life? Yeah, I mean, some of it, some of it was this sort of hospital room, squig, you know, scribbling, or you know, when I was staying with my with my parents to to help out during periods, um, just this notebook scribbling that I was doing, um, and then there are also two other things that helped me get drafts done. I participate annually in one of these April Poem a Day groups and I've been in this group for I don't even know how many years many years now with mostly with the same people new people come and some people go but there's a core group of us and I do it every April and April's really a busy month so I usually I don't get 30 drafts and most of the drafts are truly terrible um but I get the starts of something and that often um, gives me stuff to work on in the summer when I'm not teaching generally. Um, so that annual 3030. And then also I have a, a writing group um, at my college that I facilitate for students and anyone else where we just get together and write once a week. And I, I also, you know, a lot of times those drafts are just super rough. They're not anything much, but often there's a spark there that might later turn into something. So those things kind of help keep me at least kind of lightly tethered to writing during the busiest times of the school year. And then during the breaks, um, like I think like every teacher, I'm always like, okay, now I have to write everything. <laughs> um, so during the breaks, I I try and I try and put it all together or mostly, mostly I'm revising at that point. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. I think I've had a similar experience with um, producing sort of like the starts of what might be some poems I want to work on, you know, breaking that process up. Whereas I think earlier in my writing um, journey, I had more time. So I would maybe just spend you know, take take something from start to finish and then start the next poem, start to finish. Um, but this is such a good, you know, it's so wise to have this this sort of rhythm between, you know, the, the generative stage, maybe doing a lot of generative work in one period. And then, like you said, later on coming back and saying, oh, something's here. I want to work on this. I'm going to take these forward in this way and go through that the rest of the the revision process so um, that seems infinitely wise yeah it seems accident totally accidental to me it's just circumstantial but it, but it kind of works it <laughs> so works. it works and like you said you have a whole book to prove it that 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 can work and we can do it so I just want to celebrate yeah <laughs> so I am curious about, so titles tend to be um, this part of the process that comes typically at the end, um, a book title in particular. Uh, Dear Gravity, on the other hand, those poems, it sounds like that title maybe sort of followed you through the process, but in terms of the book's title, how did you arrive at that and did you have any working titles? Um, surprisingly, I don't think I did. I think that Anchor is the title that I came up with pretty much right when I realized that it was possibly a book, um, which is really unusual for me for, for the, both the previous books they had, they went through like 15 or 16 titles. I just couldn't, I, I, you know, I couldn't figure it out, but, um, but with Anchor, um, there's an image in one of the Dear Gravity poems, um, where I say that that um, my father's legs, which were filled with fluid, were an anchor. And so I had that image in my head. And then also I was just thinking of, um, you know, the stuff that the stuff that grounds you to your life. It's not only gravity that keeps us down, but um, but also I was thinking about family, both both from the child and the parent perspective they're kind of the anchors and um yeah I don't know I just it, it just felt it felt right right away 
Um, I can't remember exactly, you know, what it was that made me think of Anchor or pick it out from that poem. But once once I had it, that was that was what I wanted to stick with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It's a nice, concise title. Um, and it, it's this aspect of of um, it's a way of embodying, I guess I would say the the primary that that meditation on gravity, right? So gravity is the thing that makes the anchor work. Anchor is the thing that sort of embodies this this um, phenomena. So I think it's a great title and um, congratulations on on it being so easy. <laughs> <In this case. laughs> um, so I also was really interested in um, in your approach to form, you know, so so kind of speaking about the the relationship between phenomena and something like an anchor as an image. Similarly, I think the poems um, embody, you know, different tonalities or different ways of approaching the subject matter. So I wonder if you might reflect a little bit for us on the way that you approached form. Mm -hmm. in yeah, so I, I often make for myself sort of arbitrary constraints um, just, just to help me, um, you know, that taming chaos thing, it just to, to help me um, have a container to work within. Um, and so that is probably most obvious in there's several, not even sure how many, there's several abecedarians in the book. Um, and that's a form that I use when I'm stuck and I'm just trying to generate something. I, I think they're immensely fun. Um, so there are some of those actual, you know, following a form poems. Um, and then with some of the other poems, I use things that you might not as a reader notice and maybe aren't even there anymore, which is I, I often start with like a, a syllable, you know, syllable count per line to sort of get me going in a rhythm. Um, I'm not, I don't write in meter except for sort of accidentally for the most part. Um, but I, but I, I do like having an idea of a syllable count to sort of help me, um, help me fall into a rhythm. Um, though often that goes away when I'm revising. Um, and I also, with the with the Dear Gravity poems in particular, I think I was, uh, part of what I was led by was this, uh, this epistolary voice, you know, this idea of what does a letter sound like? Um, and so that, that played a role for sure. Great. Um, wonderful. So I wonder if you might read uh, Tourist for us. Yes. So tourist, I'll give you a brief little sort of backstory for tourist. Um, in my parents' final years in 2017, actually, um, our our whole family, myself and my sister and brother, went with my parents for a final big trip to Italy. Italy was sort of the country of my father's heart. Not you know, none of us are Italian, but but it was a place that he loved and we all loved and we had been as a family when everyone was much younger. My dad really wanted to go back one last time um, and couldn't, they, they could not have done it without considerable help. And so um, my sister and brother and I all went, which was just a tremendous gift to all of us. Um, so, the, so there's a few poems um, in the in the book that are centered in in Italy. Um, so tourist. We stayed once above a plaza so filled with noise, sleep hovered in the room's corners like a nervy hummingbird. Halfway across stood a severe statue, memorial of a story I only ever half remembered. In new cities, I'm always partway lost, navigate by fountain and luck. I'm no magnet. My dreams too lead me only halfway to desire. I yearn or yell and the dream slips around like a loose shell. Here is some of what I have held. Baby bird, unbroken but half dead. Dying mice, the hot hands of half-grown children. My own want, 
which beats counterpoint in the veins of my wrist. You live in your head, my friend who sculpts bodies for a living says, half true. In those weeks, I only half slept, and so I was only ever partly conscious, moving through that unfamiliar landscape as a ghost might, wishing to touch every beautiful thing, but unable to recall what any of it was for. There's just so much tenderness in that, um, you know, that, that little that little journey you take the reader through in, in this um in this place that, like you said, was so important to the family. And I felt that in the book that there were these, you know, there's, there are these um, moments in, in the poems that, you know, there's lamentation, right? There's the loss, there's the grief, there's the, you know, just that the ordinary lamentation of, like you said, our mortality. And then poems like this, there, there's that tenderness that comes out and um, the, the relationships that are, sort of so precious and evident in um in in the situation so that was a really beautiful um way that the poems sort of counterpoint each other within the book thank you um so maybe before we do a final poem because i want readers or listeners to hear uh another dear gravity poem to hear how those are talking to each other in the book, but I wondered if you might um, be willing to give some advice for folks who are putting together collections. What do you wish you had known earlier? Maybe, maybe think back even before you had a first book. Mm -hmm. um, what are the, some of the things that you wish you'd known earlier that you applied in this, this third collection? Um, gosh, I feel like the thing that I always am relearning and forgetting and that I wish I would remember <laughs> is to give my my poetry life more of my very scattered attention um and I, I when I think about so with the first book um well actually both the first and second book I I feel like I they took a very long time, not because I didn't have the poems, but because I didn't, I couldn't, I couldn't conceive really of how to put them together. And also, I, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one who finds revision really, really hard work. And I, I knew, I knew that the poems in those, I mean, I always know the poems need more work. And I, had a really hard time getting the energy and the attention and also good first readers to help me to help me make move them into into a state where I was really happy with them so I mean I think my advice if I have any is just give your writing life the time and the energy that it needs for it to be something um, and I feel like that's a, a bargain I'm always trying to make and a, a struggle that I'm always you know I'm always when things are always falling off the table and I'm always trying to pull writing back onto the table but if I could advise my younger self it would be keep the writing on the table more mm, that's beautiful well and also it sounds as if um you discovered the things that that were going to help get you that next step right like you said having really good first readers mm -hmm. um finding those first readers yeah, it's really challenging to to find the folks who can give you what you need in order to create that next um iteration um so so i so appreciate this advice to <laughs> to give it the energy and attention because sometimes it really is just um permission right mm -hmm. mission to give it the attention and to know that it needs that it's going to need attention over time right I think a lot of um you know speaking personally when I think back to my earlier writing self you know I probably expected a draft to come out and then to go through a process you know until you finish in a very uh coherent or concise way and it doesn't happen that way you know it just takes time like you said. So I just deeply appreciate that advice. 
Um, would you like to read the second Dear Gravity? And how many Dear Gravities are there total in the book? There are many. There are 10. 10. 10 in the book, yes. Yeah. I think, I think I've counted book. right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and they, at one point there were more, um, some of them didn't work as well. And at some, at one point, um, my editor pointed out that a couple of them started in one place and went someplace else that didn't seem to quite cohere. And so I actually ended up splitting them into, I think two of them got split into two different dear gravities and parts thrown away and parts connected to a different poem. And so they, they went through th some things. That's great. So can I pause there for a second? And just, I just want to note that because I get this question a lot from, from poets, you know, should, should I change poems once I see them together, you know, or should they stay intact? And I think, you know, what I've seen and what you're saying is that in fact, when they come together and you look at them as a group, sometimes there are ways that they might split out. So, so that's yeah. really interesting. And I think that I'm not sure that I would have known that myself, um, known to do that myself, but I have um, the editor, Luke Hankins at Orison is a remarkable editor. I mean, he's just an extraordinary reader. And so he, he was so helpful for figuring out that kind of stuff. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm grateful for that. All right. So this is a, I think, a slightly more cheerful <laughs> Dear Gravity poem than, than some of the others. And this one is, um, is it does have mortality in it, but it also has parenting. And so Dear Gravity, on the trampoline, my son and I try to bounce each other over. We throw ourselves up and come down hard. We soar until we fall laughing and breathless to the surface. We fail to defy you over and over, and that is the game. We are bodies making room for ourselves in space, pushing the invisible curtain out of the way. Nitrogen and oxygen and the other vapors ricocheting madly, as I suppose they must always do. Everything I want is here. The breaths I take easily and the purposeful displacement of matter, my body feeling itself work and doing all right, a boy whose cells are also mine. We will never win the game. We are dying of laughter and the light is fading and the birds have started up their evening prattle that I think must have something to say about their allegiance to air, even as they land and settle on high branches. It's beautiful. And I just want to note for people who are hearing this poem but not seeing it on the page, that the lineation, the line breaks, in that poem really heighten this this sense of mortality and living so so that one line um you know we are we are dying and then there's a break of laughter um i i felt that was so poignant in the form of that poem so thank you well done well rebecca it's been such a pleasure how can people find you if you would like to be found oh i love to be found um yeah, I have a website. It's Rebecca Aronson Poetry.com. Is that right? Yes. It's um Rebe yeah, Rebecca Aronson Poetry.com. Um, and I also am on Facebook at Rebecca Aronson. Um, and I have a really kind of terribly neglected Instagram and Twitter account, both, and those are both at, at Reb Mar Ak, which is R-E-B-M-A-R-A-C-K. Great. which made perfect sense to me when I made them up, but nobody, <laughs> I, I see now that it doesn't, but anyway, that's what it is. Right now. So, so Facebook's a good place to find you and of course your website and, and your book's available from all booksellers. So um, it is. I encourage yeah. everyone to go and, and buy a copy themselves so they can um, hold this. And Orison also, I just want to uh, praise, uh, like you said, Luke Hank Hankins is a wonderful editor and there's um, a plethora of, of great books coming out from this press. So yeah, they're great. So check them out as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Rebecca. Such a thank pleasure. You.